afternoon everybody across the globe and welcome to the largest safari vehicle on the planet. We are coming to you live from Juma and Arethusa game reserves in the Tsavi Sands in the greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa, so in the top northeastern corner of our wonderful country. For those of you who don't know, my name is Janie and I have Jandre on camera with me this afternoon. And it promises to be, as always, a wonderful and sometimes unexpected sunset safari. My plan for the start. Hello everybody, good afternoon, and what a special, special way to start the afternoon with a little herd of elephants here on the northern end of quarantine clearings, but just outside of camp. These chaps have been feeding and having a drink at the Gallego camp. Large numbers of elephants have come into the area today. You're most welcome, and I'd like especially to welcome Mrs. Elsha Eastor, mother of the inimitable David, who is on camera today. Show your mother your thumb, David, just to show her that you're alive. There we go. Uh, Mrs. Eastor, thank you for producing your son. He is a fine example of humanity, and I enjoyed working with him very much. My name is James Henry, in case you're wondering. Uh, well, that's for all of you who, in case you were wondering. And you are on a live safari with a whole lot of elephants here in the northeast corner of, Safa of, South, uh, safari, of South Africa, the iconic Kruger National Park. A beautiful little elephant there. And you're on a live safari, as I said, so please do talk to us throughout the course of the afternoon. Hashtag safari live, questions at wildearth.tv. If you're on the email, Mrs. Eastor, you can send through questions or perhaps comments about your son. Uh, perhaps a little bit that gives us insight into his character. He is, of course, virtually silent, and so we don't really know much about him. He could, be, uh, he could be a prophet, he could be a, a psychopath. We're not really sure at this stage. Anyway. Look at this little fellow. He's pushing the tree over and just trying to work out how on earth that complicated appendage on the front of his face functions. He is probably about, mm, probably only three or four months old, and that trunk is almost useless at this stage, simply because there are so many muscles and nerve fibers in it that it takes a long time for them to learn how to work. Now, I remember this morning that somebody asked Jamie if elephants ever stand on their trunks, and she said young ones do. They do, but you can see that little one there, his trunk doesn't reach the ground, and it doesn't reach the ground for a very good reason, and that's because it's so uncoordinated that were it to reach the ground, they would almost certainly stand on it all the time. An adult's trunk can extend to the ground. They've got a sort of concertina-like uh, arrangement of muscles, so they can stretch it forward and pull it back and stretch it forward and pull it back. Just following mum there. Looks like a very young mother. Unless it's a... It's just a relative. But there are elephants all over the place at the moment, and just to the left of us, David, there are some very close by only about six or eight meters away. Now, one of the advantages to being as large as an elephant, as, or as large an animal as an elephant, on a hot day like this, it's about 34 degrees Celsius, they'd say. It feels like about 58 degrees Celsius. Um, 33 in 34 in Fahrenheit is about 92, if I'm not mistaken. I've forgotten that. Um, 93, no, I'm pretty close going. The advantages of being a large animal like this is that you gain heat slowly. And that means that you can be out in the sun longer than, say, a bush baby could be, or a bushveld gerbil, for example. They'll heat up very fast indeed, and so they need to be very careful about maintaining cool. Th it's often why small animals live in burrows or in little nests in trees like bush babies do because they'll either overheat or get very cold very quickly. And so you can afford to be in the sun if you are a little, if you are an elephant. You can afford to be in the sun for longer than if you're little. We had a little bush baby in the camp actually earlier this afternoon. We don't know what it was doing. It looked like it had sort of fallen out of its nest. And bush babies, of course, go into what we call a torpor. 
that I received from Taxon this morning. From what he told me, those tracks were not fresh as in first thing this morning. They were probably from late yesterday afternoon, maybe early yesterday evening. And now the question is, where are they? And how are we going to decide where they've gone? Now the chances of them staying in the block that their tracks are seen crossing into are fairly slim unless they've killed something in there. In which case, at this point, on a hot day like this, there's a very good chance that vultures or other birds of prey could actually be hugely beneficial for us in terms of finding them. So our plan of attack, I know that James is going to come and help me. I've come all the way down to the south. I was checking Treehouse Dam when I disappeared abruptly from your screens. I'm working my way up from the south and towards the last position of the tracks. I assume that James is going to do the same movement but from the north. We'll see if we can't figure out where they've gone. And while I continue on my search for the lions, an elephant baby is doing some wonderful things, so let's pop over there. So we found across, we, we've come across here, half trunk, the elephant. That's her there in your picture. Oh, sorry, it's not, no, that's, a, that's her probably either her first child. No, hang on, hang on one second. So Dave, if you can come to the right a little. There we go, that's the half-trunk female. We've been seeing her a while. Now, she's got a new calf who's there, just in your picture there, only about three or four weeks old probably, maybe up to six weeks. Then she's got two others who are normally with her. We think both her offspring. The one probably coming up behind, and then I think Ah, the one far behind there. Right, then she's got two more friends today. We haven't seen these ones before with her. The first one that Dave started on looks like a pregnant female. She looks like she might give birth fairly soon. That's the one on the left-hand side of your screen. And then in the far distance, the half-trunk female's other... Could be a sibling, could be her very first offspring. So her little herd, which is normally just four, has swelled to six. And the little, little one, or not the little one, but the one in front of her, to the right of your screen, is a young bull. Carry on through here. James in Ohio, you a very nice question about heat. And of course, heat balance is a massively important part of any animal's life out here. Um, you want to know if thick skin helps with heat balance. James, I am, yes, I'm, I imagine it does help with heat balance quite a lot. An elephant's skin is interestingly not waterproof. And so while I don't think they have sweat glands, they can lose heat via evaporation in the same way that you and I can. But our skins, of course, are waterproof. That's not to say they fill up with water if they get into water, but it's not as waterproof as ours. Look at the little one there giving us a bit of a head shake, showing us how very big and strong he is. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
I just want to quickly see what this elephant is eating. Hello, Debbie. You're interested in why, when. Look at how brilliant that cow is. Just, Debbie, I'll get back to you. You can see that she's got her trunk has been chopped off, but she's completely managed to compensate for it by wedging the plants between her trunk and her foot. And that allows her to pick up whatever it is that she wants to eat. So I don't think her life is hampered at all by having that trunk chopped off there. Um, Debbie, you want to know when they start eating <laughs> in greenery? Well, look now. That little thing is just over a month old. It's already trying to start to eat greenery. And so they'll stop almost immediately, but they don't wean properly until they're about two years old. Sometimes even longer they'll try and suckle, but about two years old they'll suckle until. Now you can see that trunk is hopeless. It's not strong enough to, put, to, to, to tear the, the leaves off there. It's definitely not strong enough to actually be used to break off a piece of that plant. You're just kind of shaking it around a bit. Oh, this is fantastic. Look at that. Now it's playing with something called a devil's thorn. And I don't know how edible those things are. Devil's horn, sorry. And the mother is not eating that plant. Feeling around for a specific type of plant and then selecting it, wedging it with her foot and pulling it out of the ground. There's a young bull making a noise. This is fantastic. This is just very special. Ah, well, uh, Luke, it's not that obvious. You say, aside from the obvious, how do you tell a male from a female elephant an adult? Um, Luke, it's not actually that obvious at all, given the fact that you can't see the external genitalia. So you cannot see a bull's testicles and you cannot see his penis either. They are within the sheath, which is actually very similarly positioned to a female's opening. And so it's, you can't look for genitalia. What you can look for, though, if you look at that cow, David, you can get in under her shoulder there. You can see that a, an adult cow, even if she hasn't had uh, calves, will have slightly swollen mammary glands and they're right under the shoulder there. You can see she's actually got fairly small ones and so not even though she's had at least two calves uh, but you can see in between her front legs uh, there's a very obvious swelling where in the bulls there clearly isn't. That's the easiest way, actually. But you, people will tell you that you need to look at the, the shape of the forehead, that a female's got a much squarer forehead, a male more round, that a female's back is straighter, a male's more rounded. Yes, that is, those are both true. But, you know, you do get such variation. And then, once you find an enormous big bull, there's no mistaking it. Once you've seen an enormous big bull elephant, you can't replace, you cannot confuse him for anything else. He is so much bigger than the females, almost a th third again the size of an adult cow. You can also, the tusks are a bit skinnier, and that's how I told um, David, you just get to this chap right in front of us here. This guy's gonna be a big tusker when he's older. Now that, I mean, unless I'm very much mistaken, I just took him for a bull, I didn't actually look. All I looked at was his tusks. They are quite thick, you can see they're much thicker than tusks of the same length on a cow, and they kind of point forward. So, I mean, unless I'm very much mistaken, that's a young bull. Although, I mean, <laughs> I'm looking at him now, and he's got a pretty straight back and a pretty square forehead, but he doesn't have, any swelling between his legs, between his front legs, that would indicate mammary glands, but I might be wrong. Might be a young cow. I don't think so, though. So if you look at the tusks on our half-tailed cow there, Dave, to the left, you can see that they are much skinnier. And you can also see there, if you look carefully, a groove cut into the left-hand tusk and what that groove is, is from her 
breaking branches off using the tusk, much like she's doing with her foot and the grass, wedging there, or not the grass, the little forbs that she's eating, wedging them between her trunk and her foot. She will wedge branches between her trunk and the tusk, and that's eventually led to that groove being cut in there. Now eventually it'll break off, of course, that little piece. All right, let's go and have a look at Jamie. She's got some zebra. And if you look very carefully, at quite a distance through the leaves, you can see the herd of zebra that we were looking at. I had to stop for them just in case there's a chance that James and Dave's little zebra foal is amongst them. No sign, but they are quite far away and quite far into some dense bush. Now that calf could well be there. I'm sorry, not calf. It's not a calf. It's a foal. Dearing me. And keep your eyes peeled. It might be in the back there somewhere. We're not that far from where James witnessed the birth, probably about a kilometer and a half, so just under a mile away. And already that little zebra foal within hours of its birth would have been capable of wandering through. But since we're here, we've got Nikki's favorite tree. <laughs> we just thought we'd stop in the shade and reminisce about the fact that we were here. Oh, I've made myself sad now. Okay, we won't think about that. The Balanites tree. This is probably the biggest torchwood on Juma. It is such a stunning tree. Oh, a lovely message from a viewer and Karen who is watching in Sacramento which is apparently an awesome place to be my parents have been there I haven't managed to get there yet but Karen has been an addict of Safari Live since Big Cat Week but hasn't actually sent through any comments until today Karen it's an absolute pleasure we're glad that you enjoy all that we can bring you it's our greatest pleasure is to be able to share the love of the place that we live in and love ourselves and to be able to share it with viewers across the world is one of those really special things. But Karen, you were saying, wouldn't we love to see a grizzly bear live in the wild? Absolutely. There are all kinds of wonderful magical potentials that I think we've all considered. Imagine filming wolves hunting live or tigers moving through the jungle live. There's just so many possibilities for us to consider. One day, but Karen, you have to just keep asking all of your friends and tell all your friends about a Safari Live. In the meantime, James's little elephant calf is up to mischief. Let's have a look. I don't know how much mischief it's up to, but it's certainly up to some interesting play behavior. Now, I imagine that life for an elephant must be pretty boring. I mean, all you do is walk around the place trying desperately to find enough to eat, especially during the course of a drought. Now, what I've found with the young bulls especially is when you drive up, it's almost like they are relieved for some kind of distraction from the endless search for green food to eat. And they come up to the vehicle and have a look and then maybe spend a little bit of time interacting slowly with you. And then they have to get on with the process of finding more food to eat. And I think it's the same for that little calf who doesn't have any playmates, still too young. In a larger herd, it would, might have some playmates. And certainly these youngsters here around it will start to play with it once it gets a little bit older. But for now, it's just mum. And mum is desperately trying to find enough to eat during the course of this drought in order to f make enough milk to feed the little one there. And so I think having a car around must be quite an entertaining thing. It's right, it keeps turning and looking at us and holding his ears out. See, just like that. <laughs> Hello, Heidi in Las Vegas. I must just tell you that in Las Vegas at the moment, there's a tournament of the newest Olympic sport, which is, of course, debuting at the Olympics this year, and that is the sport of rugby sevens. Great game, that is. Uh, Heidi, there's a tournament in Las Vegas at the moment. Go down and watch it once we've finished our safari. Um, you want to know about 
Why, how these elephants keep this little one safe? You thought safety came in numbers. Heidi, it does come in numbers to a certain extent, but for an elephant, size is its greatest protector. And so lions and hyenas in this area, which would be the only things that could possibly take on an elephant this side, will be very nervous of taking on a mother um, with a little baby like this. She will do some serious damage to a lion or a hyena if she got hold of it. Those would be the only two predators that would think about attacking a little baby like this. And we did have an incident, excuse me, we had an incident a little while back at Arethusa where a very new calf was set upon by about 16 hyenas and the herd beat them off. I mean, they eventually gave up and went away. So there is a risk, absolutely, but it's not so much the numbers as the size of the elephants that will put off the predators. That's not always the case. I mean, in this particular area, it's highly unlikely to find predators with a, having killed an elephant. It's much more likely in Botswana and other places where elephants have to migrate large distances to get to sufficient water and grazing. Then you find them like in very weakened states and their predators, especially lion prides in Savuti, for example, will specialize in killing weakened elephants or elephants weakened by drought or the dry season. But out here, not so much. I've never actually seen it. In 10 years that I've been working in and around this area, um, I've seen one or heard of one elephant kill, and that was hyenas, and they took out a very crippled four-year-old elephant. There they go. Let's just watch them. I wonder if they're not going to decide to go off and have a drink now. We're going to watch these elephants for a little bit longer, but let's head across to Jamie. She looks, sounds like she's got something quite amusing to show you. I have a secret to tell you all, and we'll have to keep it just between us. But when I came around this corner and saw the buffalo on the termite mound, I initially thought it was an elephant which is one of those terribly embarrassing moments in my life that do occasionally happen. You automatically see something at a certain height and your brain fills in the spaces and sometimes it fills in those spaces very, very incorrectly. Now this is interesting. This is a very large a giant oh, buffalo herd. Perhaps I should call James on the Game Drive channel and tell him that there is a giant herd of buffalo. And James once got very overexcited in term, when he saw a breeding herd of buffalo for the first time in the wild and called out over the Game Drive channel that there was a giant herd of about a hundred buffalo moving through. But this is interesting because I think these buffalo have been somewhere around here the whole time. And as our regular viewers know, there's nothing lions like to do better than follow behind buffalo herds and wait for the opportunity. And you never say never, even though it's been incredibly hot this morning, there is a distinct chance that if the Inkahumas were hungry, they might have decided to have a go at one of the younger sub-adult calves of this herd. We've seen them do it before. Definitely not an impossibility. Now that, I think, has changed the, ball, the game for this afternoon. We'll be trying to at least monitor the movements of this buffalo herd. I'm not going to stay with them the whole time, but I'm going to loop around towards the back and see if I can't find the Inkahumas. The reason that buffalo has wandered up onto the top of the termite mound over there is there's a couple of reasons. One is that there's quite often more nutritious grass to be found, grass and trees, on the tops of termite mounds because the termites have brought nutrients up from the lower levels of the soil. So the grass that grows there sometimes is a little bit more nutritious, but also it gives her a nice vantage point to look out and look for any threats that might be ahead of them. They definitely don't have the best eyesight of any of the animals out here, but they do have a very, very solid sense of smell. They'll probably carry on walking into the wind, make sure that they smell any kind of predator. The other nice thing about herds of buffalo like this, and this is actually a giant herd, uh, I would guess at at least 250, probably more, I'd say 300, 400. They're all looking in okay condition. She looks absolutely fine. There are a couple of skinny buffalo wandering around, but 
most of them... Ah, that's what I was looking for. Here we go. I've seen a few of them, but I haven't really managed to get them on live yet. There is one brand new wobbly little calf just ahead of us. And I'm going to try and see without startling the herd, if we can get a view of him. A little bit of a delay, as far as I can tell. Look, I've never worked in the Sabi sands at this time of year before. But my general experience with buffalo is that their calves, you start seeing the first calves sort of around December or so. I'm still looking for him. Sorry, Jandra. I definitely saw him somewhere in here. But I haven't spotted him yet. You large buffalo herd wandering through. Yes, my general experience with buffalo calves is that you start to see the first ones in sort of around December. He is. Mm, there he is, Jandre, coming through now at the back, just behind the aerial. Here you go. Little tiny wobbly thing, well done. <laughs> Welcome to the world, little one. Not going to be an easy year ahead for you, for you or your mom. I don't want to move forward too much more. I think we'll startle the whole herd. And if I'm quiet for a moment, you can actually hear the rustling and the nibbling of the herd moving through. It's not a subtle thing, this number of buffalo. big bull wandering through. We saw that female up on the termite mound wandering up sure-footed and pretending to be an elephant. Only to me though. Alice watching in Ohio is looking at the buffalo on the termite mound and was wondering whether animals made her wonder whether or not animals ever actually get vertigo. Alice, I don't think so, but I'm not entirely sure. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a possibility that some elephants could get vertigo. It'd be awful if you were a giraffe and had vertigo. That would really suck. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. I've never thought about it before. Imagine being a bird with vertigo. That would be even worse than being a giraffe with vertigo. I've often spoken before about hardy dars and the way that they call as they're flying and that wah sound that they make. And I've always been told that that was because they're terrified of heights. So you never know. It's going, flying along. <laughs> looking at me like I'm a complete idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buffalo. I'm being a hardy dog, can't you tell? All right, buffs. No, my hardy dog impression didn't do very well. A tough crowd. It's a tough crowd, apparently, this morning, uh, this afternoon. Nice opportunity to just have a look at the different sizes. It's a stunning mixed breeding herd. They all look to me like they're in fairly good condition. The hip bones are starting to peak out. And of course, the poor buffalo, like the elephants, also having to cover enormous distances at the moment to get to the food that they need. Luckily, there's quite a bit of greenery about. It's far greener here than when I left to go on leave 10 days ago. So far, only one little baby. I'm fairly certain that the drought has something to do with that. They don't have a set breeding time, like Impala, where most of the lambs are born around the similar week or two at the end of the year. And generally, their births are spread all the way from December across to April. Now, my plan is to go around the back of this herd and see whether we've got any sign of the Inkahumas following them. While I do that, apparently the elephants have decided to come and pay a visit to our home. Right, the elephant there you can see is crossing the road. And Dave, will you just pan quickly to the side and you see they're going to where we live. They've obviously decided that they have heard of the immense success and delight of the frozen cheesecake consumed today and uh, they wanting their own piece of it, of course, because it's much nicer than eating tannin-rich variable bush willow. 
Now, the cheesecake, of course, was made in honor of the fact that it is Mother's Day in the United Kingdom today. Uh, not in the rest of the world. I'm not sure why the United Kingdom celebrate their mothers on a tightly, totally different day from the rest of the world. But there it is. So if you are a mother in the United Kingdom and you're watching this, uh, well done for your achievements. And I hope your children treated you with due respect and adulation. It's quite a good word for a drought, adulation. I'm just going to talk very quietly now because we are obviously very close now, only about two and a half meters from this little baby. And the half-trunk female is moving these sticks across because there's lovely green grass underneath where they are. Isn't that cool? It's so amazing. Um, Luke in Brooklyn, nice question. Do elephants move in a purposeful fashion every day or is it just kind of a haphazard movement towards food and water? A uh, bit of both really. Um, their movements are completely dictated by the need for food and the need for water. They will need to drink at least once a day, especially in hot conditions like this. So what that does mean is that they must move to water. Then in between those times, the older elephants will know where to try and look for food. And so they will move in some ways to specific areas that they know are rich in food. Otherwise, it will be kind of a haphazard random look. So we are now about, hmm, say 50 meters from the entrance to our little home, 200 feet. The elephants can't get in there because there's an elephant fence there. The little one could go in, but the others will eventually get zapped on the head by a little jolt of electricity, which I can tell you from personal experience is deeply unpleasant. See how she tries to move the sticks out of the way? just to get those little bits of highly nutritious green grass. It's probably a species called Panicum, or genus called Panicum, which is a very nutritious kind of grass that the animals will seek out after some good rains. Let's just try and get into slightly less backlit position. Hello, Tim in Arkansas. Please don't ever think that any of your questions are silly. You want to know how a lion manages to kill an elephant given the thickness of an elephant's... Oh, look at that. Look at that. Given the thickness of an elephant's skin, exactly evidenced by what she's doing here. I'll stop here, actually, for now. Uh, Tim, it's a case of jumping on the elephant eventually and eventually exhausting it. It's a horrible thing to watch. It becomes so exhausted that it eventually collapses and then they will try and get into the body, uh, probably much like they did with that zebra foal the other day, almost eat it alive. Um, they will have, a go have at the trunk, they'll have at the sort of soft bits at the back end and try and get into the carcass that way. But yeah, Tim, it's, it's difficult for them to get into it. It can only be done with an elephant that is in a compromised nutritional state, already weakened and then becomes completely exhausted by the attentions of, say, nine or ten lions leaping on its back. And it would be highly unlikely that it would be a, an adult. Look at that. I mean, that is a very large tree. She's just kind of moving quietly out the way there. That would take a tow rope and a vehicle to move out the way. And the little one continues to stand there playing with little bushes, trying to make out that she's being adult about life and eating. But in actual fact, just playing, and I'm sure getting quite bored in the process. No doubt, absolutely loving the greenery there. She specifically moved that big buffalo thorn tree out of the way, and the buffalo thorn has got lots of nutritious leaves on it. <laughs> She's got irritated. 
irritated by something. I think it was the other elephant coming up, just warning her to leave the little baby alone. Maybe feel or hear, you definitely can't feel, but maybe the sensation of hearing it uh, will help you to feel it. A lovely breeze coming in out of the southeast. That's the kind of um, prevailing wind that comes through here from the southeast. That's where our weather comes from. And it's very cooling on what is a very hot afternoon. And you know, so often we go out at this time of the day and we don't see anything because it's so hot and we drive around and the sky is bleached and it's really kind of um well it's kind of not disconcerting but it's it's not a feeling of uh, great wonder and then suddenly the light starts to soften or you come out and there's a herd of elephants doing this sort of thing just feeding and acting and just the whole magic of this place uh, takes over again and becomes such an unbelievable pleasure to be out here, even in the heat. And I love the expectation of this time of the day because we know that the sun is going to disappear shortly into the west and then the light will soften and the cool will come and that perfect evening time will settle over here. Debbie, in Vancouver, I don't know if I can answer your question. I'm going to try and think through it, though, and if I get it wrong, please feel free, for, to, if you do know the answer, to hashtag Safari Live us with great haste. Debbie, you say you've read that grass stems have more water in them during the course of the evening as opposed to during the day. Um, let's just think about what happens in a plant. So during the day, the plant is using um, sunlight and carbon dioxide to create sugar or glucose and oxygen. That's what's going on inside the plant. Then at night, a plant is using um, Oh, no, hang on. The hydrogen comes from water, though. So it's using water. It's, it's using car carbon dioxide and water to create, through the using chlorophyll and sunlight, it makes sugar and oxygen. Then at night, it does metabolize a bit of that sugar. And I'm sure water is involved in that process. I don't know, Debbie. I'm afraid I'm going to have to tell you that I'm not sure if that is true or not. It might well be. Now this is interesting because she's given a command. That female has decided it's time to go off. Now there's a water hole just around the corner here. The Galago pan is just over there. And I wonder if they're not just gonna head around there and have a drink maybe. Or if she's just decided, because there's another vehicle there now, that there's too much attention around her little one and she's gonna move on. I think it might be the latter. Oh, there's something nice to eat there that she spotted. Anyway, I think we're going to leave them now, everyone. Let's probably going to go and head up towards uh, Buffalsook Dam and see. Apparently, the lions were found there later on this afternoon, sort of between Buffalsook Dam and Cheetah Cut Line. I'm not sure how much signal Jamie's going to have over there. She is on her way there, but let's go and try and give her a hand and see if we can't track them. Right. In the meantime, let's head across to her. She is on her way there now and she'll give you a better idea of what's going on. So I've got an update for you on the movements of the Nkuhumas. I've been chatting to one of the landowners who was out after we finished our sunrise safari this morning and they actually found the Nkuhumas all the way to the east of Buffelshook Dam on the Torchwood Buffels Hook boundary, so it's right top to the north eastern corner of Juma. The mystery to me is how, without 
might be means of some kind of a teleportation device or wings or secret wormholes or tunnels. How on earth the Nkavumas managed to move from where they left tracks here to that side of the reserve without any of us picking up on their tracks in any other position. I don't understand. They must have walked down maybe one of the main roads and the tracks just got driven over by vehicle traffic. Just going to be one of those mysteries for us. And perhaps they've been taking a few lessons out of the Queen Karula's books in terms of doing interesting things with their tracks and skipping across roads without leaving any evidence of their presence. Hello, little family. <laughs> little baby in the middle. Perfect miniature of the adults. I've actually watched this crowned lapwing baby grow up. There were originally two. I'm not sure what happened to the second one. But our viewers have seen this particular youngster on and off. There's either mommy or daddy watching closely. Both parents in the lapwing family are very much involved in the raising. There you can see the size difference and a slight difference to the shape of the head. Here comes mom at the back. And they've done well to raise their little offspring. Let's go forward a little bit. Interestingly, with lapwings, they've got a very interesting nesting technique. They build these little hollows in the ground and lay eggs that are beautifully camouflaged but completely unprotected from anything wandering through. And you have to wonder how many times they lose clutches of eggs to something wandering around, like an elephant or a giraffe or even a herd of buffalo that might move through. I mean, they're not even protected under bushes. They are completely out in the open. However, if the adults do happen to be around the nest, they will very, very aggressively protect them. And I have solid memories as a child of walking through open fields at school and being dive bombed and at one point pecked by crowned lapwings, or as I knew them then, crowned plovers, before the name changed. Now they're not, a not afraid to throw their weight around when it comes to protecting their nest. But I can't imagine that that has much of an effect. <laughs> Contact calling to the other two. I can't imagine that it would have much of an effect on a herd of buffalo, for example, wandering through. The other interesting thing about their nesting strategy is, unlike most of the birds that you would get in the sort of the North Americas and the European countries, where birds have to work to keep them warm, plovers, have, plovers and lapwings have the exact opposite problem. They actually have a problem keeping their nests cool. So rather than sit on them directly, they will stand and shade them and sometimes even go and fetch water, wet their bellies and then come back and wet their eggs so that there's a bit of a breeze and a bit of a cooling pattern moving over them. There's another little family here, also one that we're fairly familiar with. We saw them yesterday afternoon around the mud wallow. The mud wallow is already dry in the space of time between yesterday afternoon and this afternoon. 24 hours and the mud wallow is gone. Didn't help, I think, that the buffalo have been wandering through and sort of making away with half the sticky mud. But there's our little warthog family. There was a second, oh, there we go. There was, I was going to say there was a second female, but she's also going to come and join this group. I'm fairly certain that both of these little piglets moving about on their knuckles belong to the larger female that you're looking at on your screen at the moment. It's so much fun to watch them imitate the adults even at such a young age. And my absolute favorite thing about warthogs, for those of you I've definitely mentioned it for most of the regular viewers, but those little tufts of white on the piglet's cheeks are nature's way of making them seem like they've got tusks as some sort of mimicry in a way. Definitely not terribly convincing but meant to make them look far more intimidating than they actually are. I know a lot of you have been exceptionally concerned and I've actually received a couple of messages asking for an update on the warthog mum that is quite, quite badly ill. She's very emaciated. I'm afraid at the moment I don't have an update. I think that as far as I know, it's that female that lives around twin dams. 
I haven't seen her since I arrived back at work, but I did see the screenshots. She's not healthy, but she has managed to keep her little ones looking fairly well fed. So whatever she has obviously hasn't passed on to them. We don't know what happened to her. Cute little ones moving around. It seems as though it's become something of a baby themed day because James has just found a baby antelope. So let's pop over there and have a look. Not so much a baby theme as a British mother's theme, I think. There is a mother kudu with two babies and a much older uh, young, young bull. You can see he's probably about, mm, he's probably pushing two years now. Now, I would have said that they were twins, even though that is massively unusual, except for the fact that there is another female just to the right of us looking. Uh, at least left of us, sorry, Dave. And I think that she must be the mother of one of these little ones. Uh, she's actually quite a nice picture, Dave. If you look there, you can see her ribs. And the important part of that is not so much that she's a skinny kudu, it's just that the draft is obviously now taking its toll. She's tall, you know, she's probably about, mm, I'd say she's at least five foot 10 at the, at the shoulder. Now, Rusty Pipe, we had a similar question to this this morning. During a drought, you say, will people, yes, sorry, I, I must just say that again. I am talking to somebody called Rusty Pipe. That is correct. Um, oh, look, 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 there's the little one coming up to its mum. Uh, Rusty Pipe, you want to know if animals will breed less during the course of a drought. Will they physically make a decision, perhaps, to breed less or have an unconscious physiological response? Rusty Pipe, I think what happens is that once animals become nutritionally compromised, their chances of carrying a fetus to term and therefore producing a baby are reduced. Their chances of producing sufficient milk to suckle and nurse a youngster obviously are reduced at the same time. Will they not breed because conditions are adverse? I don't know if that would happen or not. I mean, I assume that... Um, you know, if it was really bad, then obviously the females would probably not come, in, come into estrus because they wouldn't be able to lay down an endometrium that could um, take a, an embryo and therefore they might not even ovulate. And so I'm sure that would happen. I don't ever think, though, that there's a conscious decision not to breed because conditions are... Um, adverse. So I think it's probably purely physiological and I'm sure that there are lots of physiological reasons during a drought for why uh, breeding might be reduced. A lot of them, however, to do with um, sort of infant mortality, perhaps a spontaneous abortion of fetuses if in really compromised females and I think that's probably what happens. but I don't think they make the decision not to have babies. Ooh, Rebecca, nice question. While we're sitting here, David and I um, staring straight into the soon-to-be setting sun, you want to know how much the temperature drops by the time the evening comes. Um, well, the coldest temperature it will get to probably at four o'clock tomorrow morning is about 22 degrees Celsius, which if I am not mistaken is roughly 67 or so, 67 around there Fahrenheit. And then it's 34 now, about the, as hot as as it's been during the course of the day, and we know that that is 92 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's quite a drop, but not quite like, um, I think it probably drops much more in the summertime, at least in the wintertime. David, she's suckling there, you see that? I was right, that is a mother. No, no, not that's a mother. <laughs> that one's got horns. It ain't gonna be suckling anyone. There we go. That one was just having a little bit of a suckle. The baby's looking pretty good, Nick, I must say. They don't look to be in bad, Nick. So although that female is starting to look a bit ropey, that's probably a bit rough, she's just starting to look a bit skinny. The youngster looks good, and I think that Karula's kill was exactly the same age as one of these kudu.
Now, Deborah, while we're looking at these antelope, magnificent ones, armchair traveler that you are, you say that you have been privileged to see eight species of antelope here and a ninth, the fleeting glimpse of the sable antelope on that most beautiful infrared image of a sable antelope that we had crossing over Actually, the Juma Dam. Uh, <coughs> uh, what Columbus is uh, no Never mind. Sorry. Um, Deborah, what I want to say is I think you've seen them all. I'm just going to quickly run through them while we look at that kudu and the oxpeckers eating the ticks off her back. So we've got the spiral-horned antelope, the kudu, the nyala, the bushbuck. Then we've got impala. We've got the dwarf antelope the dica and the steenbok so that takes us to six and then of course we have well maybe a sable so that'll take us to seven and then what are the other two that are water buck we've got and i don't know if you counted wildebeest perhaps as an antelope that might be the ninth or am i leaving one out i think that's pretty much it so, Deborah, give us your list. Send us through your list. That would be fascinating, actually. I, I don't know if you've counted wildebeest as a... Here it comes. It has been sent through. There's a little one showing us its athletic skills. Right, let's carry on down the road. We'll wait for Deborah's list. It's on its way through. Kudu, Nyala, Waterbuck, Bushbuck, Wildebeest, Impala, Steenbok, Dyker, and Sable. So, those, they are... You did count... Oh, sorry, excuse me. Very rude, my glasses on. Um, it's just so bright. Deborah, you did count the wildebeest as a, or as one of the antelope, so that's fine. It certainly sits somewhere between a bovid and an antelope, so I'm happy with that. So nine, and I don't think there are any more. Yes, sable sometimes. Yes, maybe an eland, as we've seen an eland once or twice in the Sabi sands. And I mean, if you were really, really lucky, you might see a sesame. Uh, that, was, that would be highly unlikely. Um, and also, you might, uh, you might, oh, you will. I tell you what, you would see in the south. There is a reedbuck. You definitely see a reedbuck in the south sometimes along the rivers in the flay is what we call a flay which i suppose would be called a, a wetland i guess would be a flay a kind of inundated area of long grass you might find a reed buck in there and then elsewhere in the kruger other lovely antelope species sometimes roan they're a particularly beautiful thing they look like a brown sable a little bit larger and then you might find a sesame, like I say, or a hartebeest, which are two sort of relatively closely related antelope to the wildebeest, I guess. Um, you might find a Sunni at Pafuri, way up in the north, I think. Oh, and you'll also find a, Khre a Sharps Kreisbok in the Mapani felt. They're quite common in the Mapani areas. And I think that's probably about all the antelope species that we get out here. Jamie has got something to show you, uh, I think, of an aquatic nation. Oh, no, you can't go to her. She's got black screen. Uh, that's not very entertaining black screen, really, is it? All right, our plan is to head down here, Twin Dams, and then we're going to head to the eastern side of the reserve. Someone has checked uh, Brown Buffalo Dam. They have found no sign of the lions. I find it very strange that those lions should have been around there. They obviously walked far during the course of the day. A herd of buffalo is off to the east-west of us here. Why? Why they would have left that herd of buffalo when it seems that they actually followed them onto the reserve i don't know so that's quite an interesting story we're going to look out for their tracks and see what we can find there's a hornbill two hornbills much easier to keep a mammal list i feel than a, a bird list until you try and work out what bat species you're seeing then it's impossible completely impossible And Tom, you said you Liechtenstein's hard to be as ever wander into Sabi Sands. Tom, I think you'll find they're used to. Again, they're one of these antelope that like to leave their babies away from water in the long grass like a sable and a roan. And so the chances of them coming into this area with all of the pumped water is highly, highly unlikely. And that, of course, has been one of the great big contro controversial and um, 
I think, interesting discussion points around ecology, especially on private land, is that the amount of water that has been pumped, and as I said, because everybody who's got a piece of land wants to have some water because then they've got water in front of their camp and animals will come and have a drink. But what it has done is substantially reduced the biodiversity of mammals in the area because some like to be near water, some like to be away from water, in fact, have to be away from water because their youngsters uh, need to be hidden in long grass away from predators. And that's why we don't get sable here anymore. And I mean, sable at one stage in the South Sands before it became a sort of commercial ecotourism area used to be shot for rations to feed laborers. That's how many there were here. So instead of um, culling impala to feed people, they would be shot, uh, they'd shoot sable. Isn't that unbelievable? Now you see one every so often. They're, they are bred in great number, of course, around the place for game sales. Uh, Luke, a very uh, astute question. Is there a difference between an antelope and a gazelle? Uh, there's a subtle difference, Luke. Um, physiologically, I'm not sure that I could tell you exactly what that was, but they do come from a different family. Uh, but very similar physiology. Uh, they are ruminants. And the only gazelle we get in South Africa is the springbok. And up in East Africa, of course, quite a few gazelle species. But otherwise, they're almost precisely the same. I think, if I'm not mistaken, all gazelle females also have horns. But I stand corrected on that. So it's still rather beastly hot at the moment. Hoping it'll cool down. I'm sure it will. Ah, now Mimi, you are just 16 years old and you want, or 15 years old, Mimi, you want to know where you find oryx. Oryx are desert species, much like the springbok, which I just mentioned. Uh, they like to live in very dry areas. They have incredible adaptations for dealing with massively dry and hot weather. Their body temperatures can, they can allow them to rise to levels that you and I would definitely have heat stroke at. Uh, same with the springbok, and they're found in desert areas, the Kalahari and the Namibia and the Namib Desert and all the way around there. So that's where you'd find an oryx. And I mean, if you, if you Google oryx, I guarantee you, the picture you'll see is that iconic one of an oryx standing in front of those massive red dunes at Sosa's Flay in Namibia. Wonderful, wonderful picture. Just quickly before we go across to Jamie, she was talking about the sick warthog. Here she is. And they're eating elephant dung. This is what, buff, this is what they do sometimes. Oh, this is just a sad thing to see. She doesn't seem to be getting any better either. They're eating elephant dung. Warthog will often eat elephant dung because, of course, there's still lots of nutrition in elephant dung. Much of the dry material within the elephant dung is undigested and therefore or partially digested and so pretty healthy. They're not eating elephant dung now. They're actually grazing. But you can see she's in a bad way. The little one is still fine. All right, Jamie's got some slightly less distressingly nutritionally compromised ill warthogs. Let's go across to them. They're a bit more cheerful. A very sad sight that you got to see with James. And I thought I'd just stop to give you a nice healthy warthog family to mitigate the distress of that sighting a little bit. We've got two very happy, healthy little ones and a very healthy mom as well. Amazing to see them already acting completely as adults would. So at only a couple of months old, and I mean, I'm guessing, I'm not a world expert in aging warthogs, but their tusks start to appear at six months. They're a little bit younger at this stage. No, no sign of the tusks coming through. And I'm guessing that these guys are about two, three months old and already fairly much reliant on solid food rather than having to use the resources of their mom and suckle and you find with all of the herbivore animals 
that the offspring very often wean far faster than something, for example, like a hyena or a leopard or a lion. They learn to stand on their own four trotters much faster. And that's good news for the two little ones of that sick mommy warthog, because if she does die, there's still a chance that those little ones could survive. And as I said, they, to see them imitating the natural adult behavior, which includes, come on little one, please, please cooperate. Are you going to go down? <laughs> no. But Dolly was watching our earlier sighting and wondering about or how interesting it is that they go down on their, their knuckles and was wondering why they do that. So although they are predominantly herbivores, they do like to go and snuffle down to the root system. And I think that going down onto their knuckles is just an adaptation to get their noses and their mouths closer to the roots and the shoot system that they're trying to get to, the more nutritious aspects of the plant. There we go. Thank you, little one. Very convenient of you. So Dolly, it just gets their heads a little bit closer. Highly entertaining to watch. They've got calluses on those knuckles that develop very quickly. So they can use them quite effectively. And then with their long, narrow, pointed heads, also brings their mouths closer down towards the food source. You'll probably find, Dolly, that there's also an adaptation in terms of the way that they use their snouts to dig up roots, as well as the way that their teeth are positioned and the way that they use their lips to pull up shoots. All aspects that would have evolved together as they reached the form that they're in now. Yeah, you can see her nipples still extended between her back legs, so she's still suckling. Nice to see two healthy or a healthy family. I was going to tell you something and it's completely gone. Oh, I remember what I was going to talk about. So I was thinking about the tusks that grow through and I was actually thinking about it in the context of elephant babies, but I was just wondering, we know that when elephants start to grow their teeth, it itches and makes them a little bit sore, just like with toddlers teeth. Oh, hello zebra. Lots of zebra around at the moment. I think pushing in from Kruger to find fresh grazing opportunities. This looks like a solitary stallion. I don't see any others. There's a couple of stallions that move along our northernmost boundary. But yes, back to the teething. So warthog tusks, yeah, actually in a reposition, I think we'll be able to get a clearer view. And the nice thing about this particular family is they're also very comfortable with cars. So warthog tusks are teeth. They're modified in sizes, just in the same way elephant tusks are. And I wonder whether warthog babies also get that sort of teething-like stage where it starts to itch and burn, and whether they have any methods of or any plants that they might target. We know elephant babies often go and eat spike thorn leaves or silver cluster leaf leaves to relieve the pain and to numb the gums ever so slightly, as well as tambourtes. It would be interesting to know whether or not warthogs have any other methods or something similar that they do. Looks like two little females. One's definitely, oh no, it's a little male and a little female. I've seen a couple of exceptionally large warthogs in this area. And of course we always forget, and I like the constant reminders in the form of questions, from our viewers that for looking through the camera doesn't always give you the best perspective of scale. So Roy was wondering how tall is an adult warthog at the shoulder? And the answer is probably close to about half a meter or so, which puts it at about 20 odd inches. If I had to try and compare it, Roy, let's try it rather than using sizes, if I had to turn in, compare it to one of an animal that you might be more familiar with, Roy, I'm not sure if you're in America or if you are watching in Europe, but a Staffordshire Terrier, either an American Staffy or an English Staffy, so the type, the breed of dog, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but that would be a sort of uh, a rough estimate. Maybe the warthog is slightly smaller, but some of the big males that we see would equate to roughly the size of a Staffy. <laughs> if I had to pick a breed of dog to compare them to. It is something that we very often forget. But a fearsome creature, 
for a little animal this size. Not to be trifled with, and even a male leopard will think twice about tangling with an adult warthog, particularly an adult male warthog. And I know we speak a lot about this. Maybe we'll get a clear view of this female's tusks. But underneath her top tusks, she's got tushes at the bottom that are rubbed razor sharp. And as with all animals out here, they are far more powerful than you expect them to be. We spoke about the buffalo's eyesight, and Jim is wondering a little bit about the warthog's eyesight and how far they can see, whether or not their eyesight is very good. In my experience, they are exceptionally keen-eyed. They usually have spotted you from far, long before you've spotted them. But they do have relatively keen eyesight. As with most of the animals out here, they're equally reliant upon their sense of smell and their sense of hearing as well. You always, um, you, a lot of textbooks mention that, for example, that antelope species don't have the best eyesight of the animals. And I've, in my experience, I have seen them spot animals like cheetah or leopard long before I even realized that they were there. Makes sense that they have good eyesight. You need to be able to see a threat coming. I don't have the protection of a large herd like a buffalo might. So a buffalo can get away with having poor eyesight. Look at that face. Part of the, the ugly five, I believe. Perhaps a grossly unfair description. I don't think they're terribly ugly. Okay, they're not the most attractive animals out here. You could maybe use a, a spa session. A little bit of anti-wrinkle cream might not go astray. They're really not that ugly, I think, personally. But yes, the ugly five, including the leopard-faced vulture, the marabou stork, the warthog, the spotted hyena, and there's one other desperately trying to think about it. There you can see your tushes perfectly. Those lower incisors. Now those are the tusks you don't want to mess with. It's not the ones on top, it's the ones below. And as with all members of the pig family, most of you come from areas where you'll be familiar with wild boars and the dangers that they pose. Warthogs can be equally scary when they want to be. They're, never, they're not aggressive though. They'll never set out to attack people. But if you do corner them, they are capable of explosive speeds and using those tusks as formidable weapons. Always on alert. Gracie, welcome to the Sunset Safari as always. Gracie, who is eight years old, has said that she absolutely loves when all of the animals eat together and it's almost like they are having a party. But Gracie is a little bit worried. She wants to know if the animals will fight over food is because there's not so much to go around. And Gracie, no, not yet. The only time you're really going to see animals fighting each other is when they come to have a drink. And even then, they're very good at basically the biggest person gets to have a drink and because there's water for all of them they'll be able to rotate through it's just a matter of some people or some animals having to wait their turn but they won't fight too much over food it's really mostly only the lions that tend to seem to disagree when it comes to meal times the rest of the animals are fairly civilized and they do enjoy their party now one animal that we even refer to as having a party Gracie is birds. So different species of birds move around together in what's known as a feeding party and that's because they're going for the same food but they don't fight over it but there's lots of different eyes to keep an eye out for any kind of a threat. So that's a bird feeding party and we'll always keep an eye out for one to show you. But most of the time the animals are happy to feed together 
because it means that there are lots of eyes and lots of ears and then lots of noses to smell if there's any kind of threat and it's worth sharing your food and having that party provided so long as you can keep an eye out for any lions or leopards that might decide to come hunting. One last look at our happy, healthy warthog family. As I mentioned before, it's, it's positive that warthog babies wean as quickly as they do. But Romy, who is watching in Ohio, is also worrying about the youngsters of that very ill female and was wondering if she were to die, would the warthogs be accepted, would the young warthogs be accepted into another family? Romy, my suggestion is that it would be unlikely. Trot, 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 mom's, mom's gone. The <laughs> sudden panic didn't realize how far mom had got away from them, distracted by feeding. Romy, I don't think that they would be, unless she happens to have a, relate, a related female around. Maybe that, look, never say never. I personally don't think it's terribly likely. I think that they would be sort of forced to survive on their own. But you never say never. Warthogs do form what are known as sounders, and they don't always have to be related to each other. So the females will share a burrow. We've seen it with the warthogs on quarantine, for example, the two females that originally had six piglets. Although I have to be honest, I think the two piglets we saw earlier were the remains of that little family. But you see unrelated females forming a sounder. They've got extra eyes. Again, it helps to be in a group. But that's when two females have come together and given birth together at sort of a similar time. I don't see a likely scenario with warthogs babies coming in and then being adopted. But you never know. Stranger things have happened. Okay, I think I'm gonna leave our warthogs. They're slowly moving off the block. Oh, in theory. <laughs> As we leave our warthog, one final question coming through from Luke and his newly wedded wife Letitia. They're watching in Brooklyn, New York. They were Brent's guests at the very start of Brent and myself's leave and we had a wonderful time. Luke, it was wonderful to meet you as well. I'm glad that you're now jumping on board and watching the safari. Luke wanted to know why when warthogs run away do they run with their tails in the air? So the common old wives tale or old guides tale that many guides will tell you is a sort of a, a joke to see how gullible you are is that their skin is so tight that they can only do one of two if they drop their tails then it opens up their eyelids because they've got that tight wrinkly dry skin so that when they're feeding and they want their eyes open they have their tails down but when they're running away through thick grass and they don't want the grass seeds to go in their eyes and they want to close their eyes they have to lift their tails because their skin is so tight. That of course is absolute um, drivel. I was trying to think of a polite term for that. And it's more to do with the fact that it allows hogwash. Brilliant Louise, that is absolute hogwash. <laughs> that, I'd, like to, I'd like to take credit for that pun, but that was entirely Louise's and I'll give her, I'll give her that. Um, but yes, the reason that they do that is so that the babies and the mothers can move together. They're quite a lot lower than most of the antelope. All of the animals have, to a degree, a follow me strategy, so a way of keeping the herd together. And in the case of the, sorry, I'm listening to the Game Drive channel at the same time. Awesome. But in the case of the warthogs, that high tail means that it's easier for babies and other individuals to follow along behind. Right. Journey of giraffe. I wonder if these are some of our friends from this morning. We had nine giraffe this morning on quarantine, which is the largest number I've ever seen while I've been conducting these live safaris. And on Juma in particular. Nice young male feeding away. Look at the way he's twisted his neck around to get to those leaves. There's also an elephant in the back somewhere there. I'm sure I saw it. That's what the giraffe keep looking at. I 
one, two, three, four, five. We are looking at one of nature's leaf eaters, which brings me to Kathy's question in Tennessee. Kathy just wants a little reminder as to the correct term for an animal that eats leaves rather than grass, uh, predominantly leaves. And as with a giraffe or kudu, for example, they are known as browsers. So browsers eat leaves, grazers eat grass, as you suggested. They are moving in quite a dense vegetation. There's the elephant there, just in case you didn't believe me. There you go. A big grey shape hidden in the bushes. Probably, probably the same male that we saw this morning as well. They were on their way in this direction. Elephants, as opposed to being grazers or browsers, are mixed feeders. And their diet very much varies from season to season. It's safe to say at this time of year, usually they would be feeding on a great deal of grass. Unfortunately for them now, there is hardly any grass for them to feed on and they're not gonna spend too much time trying to get to the nice little green shoots. But we're gonna see more and more elephants targeting trees. And in fact, you'll actually be able to see, there'll probably be a visible effect in terms of the vegetation of this area because of the drought. The elephants are gonna start targeting areas of dense vegetation, they might even start targeting different tree species and really start to open up these thicker woodland areas. And that is all part of the natural way that this ecosystem has evolved with a species like an elephant that is capable of actually changing the face of the environment that they live in. In a couple of years, in a restricted system, which fortunately we are not in at the moment. We're in a nice open system, 4 million hectares of area. But in a more restricted system, they can actually convert a woodland to grassland. Our giraffe are playing fairly hard to get in this bright, bright light. And I believe I've been listening sort of with half an ear to the Game Drive channel and James has been conversing about some vultures. So I think let's jump onto the back of his vehicle and find out what he's been chatting about. Now there's some interesting things going on here everybody. There are lots of vultures around. We've just seen a whole lot of them take off. And one of the guys from Bufflesook came in, he's over there, and he drove in here to have a look to see because we're quite close to where they thought the Inkahuma Pride was. And what you can feel as you watch your picture is that we're falling into holes. Now these holes have been largely dug by uh, Artfuck, and just around one of the Artfuck burrows, this chap found a dead warthog. It looks like a young warthog, and we're just going to go and have an investigation and see what's happened. And there seem also to be lots of vultures around. I'm sure they're looking to try and come and eat this thing. And I'll be very interested to know how or why the warthog died. Of course, we do know that warthog are in one of the most vulnerable creatures when it comes to a drought. He's just very kindly moving out of the way for us. And we'll have a look-see over here. Hi, ah, yeah. Ah, yes. I see. Thank you very much. Now, there is the expired pig. You see it there, Dave? And interestingly, the stink, of course, is absolutely unspeakable because it has not been dead recently. Now, let us try and work out perhaps what happened here. Lots of warthog, uh, at least lots of artfark burrow around the place, so lots of ant bears that come through this area, obviously. And then I think a whole lot of uh, vultures have actually just taken off. We saw them fly off us. But there's one more, Dave, just in front of us there. A huge vulture. And if you see a vulture ever in a tree that has got leaves on it, you can be pretty sure that it is looking, sitting above something that it wants to eat. 
Now that is the most common vulture we get here, the white-backed vulture. So named because it has a white back. So I'm going to get out of the car now. I'm pretty sure there are no predators around. And we're just going to have a quick look. I'll tell you what I can see and then I'll get back in and we'll have a look, see exactly why we think this warthog passed on. Mo shook off this mortal coil, kicked to the bucket, expired. Can you hear me, David? Yes. Oh, good. Right. Now, so what we do at the scene of a crime like this is look around for tracks of predators. Plenty of vulture tracks here. I'm not worried about frightening the vulture, frightening the vulture off. Oh, it's not a warthog. It's not a warthog at all. It's an artfark that's died. This is incredible. If it wasn't so utterly stinky, I'd grab it. I'm gonna move the car so you can get a better look at it. Let's have a look, see. It's not a warthog. It is an unusual, deeply unusual animal, and I know, I mean, they're, they're not uncommon here. We just don't see them because they're out so late at night. And while looking at a dead animal is not particularly exciting, uh, seeing one that is so rare is magnificent. All right, there we go. Let me get out and point out the interesting bits to you. I just need a stick so that we can move it about a bit. Now, whenever I find an animal like this and there isn't an obvious predator around, I mean, leopard will kill artfark, but they will normally then put them into a hole. So I don't think that's what's ha killed this one. Um, what's interesting here is that whenever I see something like this, my immediately th thought is snake. Uh, maybe a snake bit it. Uh, this one is long dead, and what I want to try and do is expose its head so we can have a look there. <laughs> but it's an extremely heavy creature. <laughs> this, is, this is a dis distinctly distasteful activity. I'm going to need something heavier than that. Um, David, if Louise wants to link away while we do this, I tell her that's okay. But otherwise, we can carry on looking. Um, this is a very smelly job. But I just want you to see its head, if possible. <coughs> no, maybe not. I think a spade would be, would be better employed. Anyway, there it is, the artfark. It's a very solid, very heavy animal. So let's go across to Jamie. I'm going to try and sort of excavate a little bit, and we'll see if we can't get a better look at it when you come back to us. Well, that is truly fascinating, and I hate to take you from one dead artifact to one dead praying mantis, but that is just the way that the drive has gone. But I just had to show you this extraordinary marvel of nature. Isn't she... Oh, I don't want to block out the sun. Isn't she beautiful? That's me moving the canvas, by the way, that's causing her movement. I actually found her, or Jandre found her, on my binoculars. There you can see those incredible long arms. If you look really carefully, you might... Uh, <laughs> I want to point at things, but I can't, and I don't think I have a stick. But you can actually see the slight claws and the slight protrusions on those. There you go. You can see the serrations on the legs. And then this incredible abdomen. I'm just going to turn it over slightly. Here we go. Oh, turn a little bit. The way that her body is looking like a leaf. Ah, I've blocked the sun out, which isn't really what I want to do. Absolutely stunning. And I'm sorry if I'm slightly distracted. I'm actually going to turn it off. There's, um, there's very much a conversation about the cricket game that was happening, going on in my ear through the in-game drive comms. So I'm sorry if I lost my train of thought there, but apparently somebody made a magnificent catch um, right above his head with arms stretched right up. That's what has just come through in my ear. <laughs> but yes, she is beautiful. I was just chatting a little bit about the parasites that you find within the... She's now stuck to my finger. 
Um, please detach yourself, my dear. There we go. We're talking a little bit about the parasites that are contained in these abdomens. Now, it's not always the case, but a lot of the time, they actually have what are known as horsehair worms. And you'd be surprised. I've, I've seen it a couple of times with dying praying mantises when the worms decide to actually jump ship. Now, I'm talking about worms that if, could probably be about twice the length of her body. And they're very, very tiny and they're thin and they're packed in inside the abdomen of these insects. And it's crickets and mantids that I've seen it the most in. And what happens is they slowly start to poison the brain of the host because they are, of course, parasites that eventually cause the animal to try and drown itself because the worms reproduce in water. So they get the host species to jump in water. Make, I don't know if it's a way that they do it by making them incredibly thirsty, but they essentially drown themselves and then reproduce in that environment. So fascinating, definitely one of nature's grossest parasites. I must say, even for me, and I've got a fairly strong stomach, I found them a little bit distasteful, especially when you see the amount of them that can be packed into an animal like this, this abdomen. Look at her eyes. I'm not sure how well you can see them. Duck down. Oops, sorry. My big head in the way. You see the shining eyes and then the incredibly sensitive antenna. Mantids, of course, famous. There you can see her pupil there. Mantids, famous, of course, for the female's slightly distressing habit of consuming her mate after mating providing her body with the necessary nutrients. I think that in general we're fairly grateful that that is not a technique that's been adopted by all species. You can see the way her legs are curled up under her. I'm not sure why she died. It might have just been a natural death that she ended up on my binoculars. But a beautiful specimen. To give you a sense of scale, I'll just put my finger behind her. She's about... Ooh, it's about the length of my finger from tip to knuckle. A really stunning little insect. Okay, I think I'm going to keep her. I'm going to see and try and see if I can identify which particular species this happens to be. There are lots of different types. In the meantime, let us return to a detective, what would we call him, CSI Henry, Detective Henry, De Chief Constable Henry, and find out how his investigation of that crime scene is going. What's interesting here, of course, we've pulled this thing out. We've pulled it out, and I did this with gloves on. So for young viewers, just understand that this is done not by hand. Um, it can be... Well, it's just, you know, there are a lot of bacteria and pathogens that will exist on a carcass this old. It doesn't smell very nice. It is starting to rot. So I put some gloves on and we pulled it out by the tail and then flipped it over. And I don't know what killed it, but what's interesting that it was, it was buried all the way up to here. It was buried all the way up to this part of the body in the sand. Now, I can't see any obvious signs of injury. Um, a couple of scratches there, but I mean, you know, this stage of decomposition, it really is difficult to tell. So my, I have two top suspects here. One is a leopard that came through here, grabbed it, maybe bit it, decided it was too much or injured it so badly. And that's why it was head first into the sand trying to get away. An animal like this can dig faster than a human being can with a spade. So if you come after it, if you come after an artifact like this and you're trying to kill it, it will dig itself underground faster than you can dig after it. So that's unbelievable. So maybe it was threatened, it got half way under the ground and was so severely injured that it died before it could carry on. My other suspect is always something like a black mamba. They are obviously particularly venomous snakes and quite possibly what killed this. A black mamba is not nearly big enough to eat an artifact like this and so it would have been left alone and then devoured by the vultures and that's what will happen for the rest of the time that the carcass is around. Just a couple of things to note. The big ears, obviously, very characteristic. The long snout, like that, which is used, it's got a very long tongue in it, which it will be used to probe into uh, ant, ant nests. They eat a lot of ants, they eat a lot of termites. And then, of course, the most obvious things about this thing are its claws. Look at its claws here. And that, if you ever see an artifact track, you will see those three claws in 
the sand. Those are the most obvious things that you will see uh, if you ever track an art fark, uh, when you see them crossing the road. This, this back claw doesn't seem to make it, but those nails are, I mean, they're an inch long, and they are incredibly powerful, incredibly strong, and that's what this animal will use to dig into the ground, to get into these burrows, and then to get into and underneath the ant nests and that sort of thing. Fascinating, very sad to see it in this state. Obviously, I don't think there's anything nefarious that went on here. I think this is perfectly normal, uh, these kind of natural death, either from predator or snake, which is totally natural and normal. So, interesting stuff, and uh, vulture, vulture feathers, obviously, they've been squabbling and fighting over this kill. So, there we go. Unfortunately, dead Artfark. But you can see the size of them, probably about three feet from um, tip to tail. Very powerful shoulder muscles here. You can see incredibly powerful for digging. And lots of right, pretty attractive regal flies on it, but disgusting stink coming off here. And I think that's quite enough of this disgusting stink. I will remove these gloves very carefully and we will then press on to fairer climbs. So if you are ever in the wilderness and you find something like this, a pair of gloves like these, of course, are very useful because you don't really want to have anything to do with that on your bare skin. Right, we'll push that to the bottom of the car and continue. Amazing, David. Have you ever seen an art park before? Never. Just sorry, wrong way. Get on this way. Just amazing. Okay. Thankfully, we do carry a first aid kit, and the first aid kit has a number of gloves in it. I'll plug myself back in. And I think we'll make out our way out of this rather somber sighting and see what else we can find. <laughs> 